Hey guys, welcome to our first webcast. Um, today's lecture is going to be a bit longer than usual because I do want to go over some of the things that we're going to be doing in this class. So we're going to be in the lesson 2.1, Exponential Functions. And what we need to do is set some ground rules for how this flipped classroom is going to work. Uh, number one, and probably one of the most important, is that you guys have got to be able to take notes. If you don't take notes, then it's going to be pretty meaningless when we get into class and you don't have anything to look back at to help you with the assignments. Um, two, get in the zone. Uh, I don't know how you guys do this. You may want to pop in headphones, watch it on your phone in your room, go outside, but your 100% focus needs to be on this. You don't need to be tweeting. You don't need to be on Facebook. You need to be watching this video exclusively because otherwise you're not going to get 100% out of it that you want to get. Uh, since it is on YouTube and other file sharing sites, you can pause the video. So if you ever need to write down any notes, there are great times where you can just pause it, finish writing, writing, and then listen to what I'm saying afterwards. Uh, again, you can rewind the notes too. So you can rewind the video and uh, hear something I said in case you missed just a little bit. And you can also replay the whole video. Now you can replay the whole video maybe in class or at home if you're still unsure about a concept and maybe we'll be going over a quiz and you gotta watch this video again because you can't remember some concept we went over. So uh, those are you know the real ground rules I want to set for this flipped classroom and hopefully uh, we'll have a good time. So let's get started with the lesson. Uh, what I want to do is I want to look at these two functions and what we need to do is we need to compare these two functions. So notice I have f of x equals 4x on one side and I have f of x equals 4 to the x on the other. Notice that the thing that changes is that my variable is no longer being multiplied by a constant and it's no longer the base. Notice over here. Instead, in my next function, my exponent is actually a variable. So my variable has changed from being just being multiplied by the 4 to being the 4's exponent. So that's really, really important. And let's see how this plays out. How does it make a difference? Well, over here, if I had f of negative 3, that means I'm going to plug in negative 3 as my function value. So, for example, I'd have 4 times negative 3, which is negative 12. And then I'm just going to do this. I'm going to continue doing this so on. So negative 1, I plug in negative 1 for x. I get negative 4. 0 times 4 is 0, 1 times 4 is 4, and 3 times 4 is 12. Alright, now let's see what happens when my variable is in the exponent. So instead, if I do f of negative 3, it's going to not be f times negative 3, but f to the negative 3. Now, this is very important. The negative sign flips this right here. It flips your base. So if your base is in the numerator, so remember, this is in the numerator, it's going to make it 1 over 4 to the third. And remember, this is in parentheses, it's getting, it has an exponent, therefore both the numerator and the denominator are going to be cubed. So this would be 1 over 4 times 4 is 16, 16 times 4 is 64. 1 over 64. Same thing happens again. 4 to the first power, the negative first power. 4 to the negative first power, well, that's going to be 1 over 4. 4 to the 0, anything to the 0th power is 1. 4 to the first is 4. And 4 to the third, 4 times 4 times 4, 4 cubed is 64. So that's how we plug in function values. And notice that these values are radically different. Even though we had the same input, negative 3, we got two radically different outputs. And that's because our variable changed from being simply multiplied by our constant to being an exponent. All right. Now, if we look at the graph of these, you can kind of see the difference. You can see how f of x with, as 4x you can see how it's a straight line. So it's a linear function. Now, f of x equals 
4 to the x is what we're going to call an exponential function. So this is what we're going to be concentrating on this entire unit with exponential functions. And you should concentrate on, notice how in a linear function it goes up at a constant rate. In an exponential function, it initially has a small increase, a small increase, and notice right here, notice how the small increases, and then it radically takes off, it shoots off. So initially it has small minuscule changes, and then it grows drastically, and what we're going to say that is it grows exponentially. So the change grows exponentially. Alright, now this is a graph of f of x equals 4x. And what we want to do is we want to look at something that we've always traditionally looked at in last unit, and that's the domain. So what is the domain of my function? Remember, domain are all my x values. Well, for an exponential function, no matter what, the domain is going to be all real numbers. So it's going to be from negative infinity to infinity. Or written like that. And this is always true for the domains of exponential functions. Now, also true is that my exponential functions are going to be continuous. They're always going to be continuous through their interval from negative infinity to infinity. So anytime you see a question asking you, what is the domain of my exponential function, you know that your domain is going to be from negative infinity to, con to infinity, and there it's going to be continuous. Alright, now another characteristic of this graph that you've probably noticed, and we've worked on other graphs that look like this, is that when we have this graph, it narrowly narrowly, narrowly gets very close to a number, but it doesn't quite touch that number. Now, you'll notice right here, you can see it. And as I'm outlining it, you can see how my values are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, when we refer to this in n behavior, we always looked at the left-hand limit and we'd say the limit of f of x as x approaches negative infinity, and so as x is approaching negative infinity, we'd look and be like, well, is it going towards negative infinity? No, it's not going towards negative infinity, because it's not crossing that y-axis. It's not crossing y equals zero. And if it never crosses that point, if it gets very, very close to it, but it never touches it, our limit used to be limit of f of x, as x approaches infinity equals zero. And what we call that is an asymptote. And an asymptote, the definition that we want for an asymptote, you guys should be writing this in your notes, is a specific line or curve that a graph approaches. Now I have two examples. I say like x equals zero or y equals zero. If you have a graph, guys, if I say x equals 0, what I'm saying is look where x is 0, and x can be, x can never be anything other than 0. So that means it's going to be a vertical line. So that's if you have a function that, for example, in our reciprocal function, when we had our reciprocal function, notice that it never quite touched x equals 0. It got closer and closer, but it never quite touched it. So that would be a vertical asymptote. We have the horizontal asymptote, which we just saw over here, and we can see that in the reciprocal function. And notice that's what we call y equals 0. And with y equals 0, you can never have a value of y that's other than 1, other than 0, I'm sorry, other than 0. So it's at 0, it can never be different. You can never have y equals 1, never have y equals 2, only y equals 0, so it's never going to move from that place. It's always going to be that straight line. 
So when you're referring to asymptotes, you're referring to the point, the line, which the specific line, which the graph approaches but never crosses. All right, so let's use some of this applied knowledge and let's see how that works with the function. So over here, I have f of x equals 3 to the x. Now let's go through and let's find our domain, range, intercepts, asymptotes, whether it's increasing, decreasing, and our end behavior. For domain, we know that for all of my exponential functions, my domain is going to be all real numbers. So I already know the answer to that one. I know it's going to be from negative infinity to infinity. Or you could always write this, which stands for all real numbers. And again, you can just look at the graph and see that, how it continuously goes towards smaller and smaller x values and larger and larger x values over here. All right, range. Our range is our function output. What are my function outputs? What are my y values? So for anything that I plug in for x, what, is my, what are my possible values? And if I look at this graph, we've already discussed how exponential functions, notice they have asymptotes, this gets closer and closer to zero, but it never quite touches zero. So its minimum value is going to be zero. So remember, when we talk about range, we're talking about intervals of y, not intervals of x, but intervals of y. So this is going to be exclusive, exclusive because it does not touch zero, it gets close, but never quite touches it. Comma, what's the largest value? Well it continuously increases. It goes up and up and up, and my function value, I can plug in anything for x, and there's nothing that stops it. It's unbounded. Therefore, we refer to that as infinity. And make sure you write these in your notes, guys, because this is a very handy guide for you. All right, intercepts. So this is, where does it intercept my axis? Well, we know it does intercept my x-axis. Why do I know that? Because it gets closer and closer to my x-axis, but it never touches. So does it have a y-intercept? Well, I see one right there. And notice, my intercept's going to be where my x value is 0. If you look at where my x value is 0, that's where my y-intercept's going to be. So if I just plug in 0 to my function, if I have f of 0 equals 3 to the 0, That'll tell me where my intercept is, my y-intercept. And that is, if I plug it in, 3 to the 0 power is 1. So my intercept is going to be 0, 1. Asymptotes. Well, we've discussed asymptotes over and over in this lecture. We've discovered that it's getting closer and closer to the value, but never quite goes past it. And that value was y equals 0. So that's my asymptote. Increasing. Where is my graph increasing or decreasing? Remember, we read our graph like books from left to right whenever we want to do increasing, decreasing. If I look at my graph, my graph is continuously increasing. It has no interval of x in which my function is decreasing. It is always increasing. And remember, you want to look at it in respect to your function values. So look at it on the x-axis and on the x-axis we're going to look at my as my x increases my function increases. So this is an increasing from the interval of negative infinity to infinity. Is it decreasing? No. So it does not decrease. And behavior? Well let's look at it from the left and then the right. So from the left limit of f of x as x approaches infinity, negative infinity, I'm sorry, negative infinity. So we're looking at it from the left-hand side. What is it appearing that my what function is going towards? Well, it never quite crosses zero, so it's going towards zero. It's not going towards negative infinity because it's never going to cross zero. So it's approaching zero. doesn't quite touch, but approaches. Now my right-hand limit is limit of f of x as x approaches positive infinity as x approaches positive infinity, and I apologize, that's supposed to be an arrow. Well, let's see. As x gets larger and larger values, what is my function appearing to do? It's growing, and it's going. It's continuously going up without bound. 
So it's infinity. Now we're I have a little table here, so functions to real life values. situations. So this is where we do our applied analysis. All right, now for these following slides, you're really gonna have to copy down virtually everything on the screen because we're going into two entirely new concepts and we'll have a formula to go along with it. So the first thing we'll go over is exponential growth. Exponential growth is when a quantity increases at a fixed percent at an increasing rate over time. And that's just like what we've been, those other problems we've been covering, for example, three to the x, that's an exponential function. That's exponential growth. And you can see how my function increases at a fixed percent at an increasing rate. Notice it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger at an increasing rate over time. We see this in viruses, the spread of viruses specifically. Human population, so if you and your wife have a kid, then you have one kid and then they have two kids and then those two kids have two kids. Those two kids have two kids, then you have four kids and those four kids have 16 kids and so on and so on. So it increases exponentially. Um, avalanches, when you have an avalanche that uh, when the ice caves over on, on a mountain and the snow falls, it starts small but it grows at an exponential rate. And a nuclear chain reaction. So in those nuclear bombs, uh, one reaction sets off another which sets off an increasing uh, increasingly at an increasing rate. So many many more reactions go off at an increasing rate. Exponential decay, as you can imagine, is sort of the opposite of exponential growth. So make sure you copy this one down as well. And the difference is when a quantity decreases at a fixed percent at an increasing rate over time. So the quantity is actually going to be decreasing. And you can see that by this graph. Notice how there's its g of x equals 2 to the negative x. So we see this in radioactive material. Radioactive material decays over time. Uh, that's actually how they can check the how old something is. They use a method called carbon dating, and if they know that a certain uh, material decays into another material over time, and they know that they know that exponential decay rate, then they can find out how old some things are. That's how they found out how old some uh, dinosaur bones are because they know how how long it takes for carbon to decay. And another version of this is devaluation. So this could be devaluation on home prices or on an iPod you just bought and an electronic device. Uh, we have a formula to go along with both of these. And your book uses the formula n equals n, and we say n naught. Another way you can say that is the initial amount times 1 plus or minus r to the t. Now, the reason why we have the plus or minus is that if you have an exponential growth problem, you're going to add the 1 and the r. So if it's growth, you're going to add the 1 or the r. So therefore, you'll always have a number that's 1 or greater. If you have decay, you're going to subtract your 1. So it's going to be 1 minus r if it's decay. So therefore, the number in your parentheses is always going to be smaller than 1. n to the 0 is your original amount. So this is what you start out with. Your beginning starting out amount. And this can be with money, this can be with home prices, this can be with uh, distance traveled, anything really. It's going to be what was the initial amount, the first amount you started with. r is going to be your rate. So that's going to be the rate of increase. So for example, uh, interest. What was the interest rate? Or how fast is something growing? Something like that. T is your time. And N, capital N, is going to be your final amount. So notice there's a difference. There's a capital N, then there's a capital N with a zero in the subscript. The, there are two different things. The zero in the subscript meaning your initial amount. You can think of it when N is zero. And then over here you have N as your final amount. Alright, so let's go over one applied problem, and then we'll work more on this in class. But make sure you have this equation copied down, and on the next page we're going to have an example, and then that, that example will have it broken down. So, a population of a small town in North Carolina is 4,000, 
and it is growing at a rate of 3% per year. So, first I need to identify my variables. Well, it told me that the population of the small town is at 4,000 right now. So right now it's at 4,000. So my n not my initial value is going to be 4,000. And I wrote that down right here. Now, what is the rate at which it is growing? Well, first of all, it tells me it's growing. So I know there's going to be a plus there. I know that in my formula, which is n equals n, the initial amount times 1, it's going to be a plus because it's growing. I've identified my r as 0 0.03. We want to put this in decimal form. Write an exponential function to represent this data. Well, I just plug in the values which I found. So, my initial value was 4,000, so I plugged in 4,000. 1 plus r, which is 1 plus 0 0.03, is 1.03. And it's to the t. They don't tell us the time yet. They don't tell us the time, so we just leave it as t. What will the population of the town be in 10 years? All right, well, it tells me 10 years, so I know my 10 years, that's my time, that's going to be my t. So I plug in that 10 for my t. I'm going to get n equals 4,000 times 1.03 to the 10. Now, I'm just going to go jump in my uh, ti, and I'm going to plug this in. So, 4,000 times... 1.03 to the 1.0 to the tenth, and TI gives me 5,375.665. And so, obviously, you can round up since we're talking about people, and you can say that we expect the population of the town to be 5,376. So there will be 5,376 people living in this town in 10 years, assuming that it grows at that 3% rate. All right, I know this was a bit longer video. We had a lot to go over. Go ahead and rewind any parts you need to, maybe replay it a bit. Make sure you have all of these notes copied down. And I'll see you next time for the next video. All right, see you guys.